now. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Albert at Sirius. Uh, Albert is a professor at UPC Barcelona. He probably doesn't need an introduction, but I think I will give one anyway. He's a legend in complexity theory uh, for many reasons. Uh, he has two PhDs, one in uh, proof complexity and another in uh, finite model theory. I believe I got that right. And in addition, he has uh, done uh, excellent work in uh, proof complexity, descriptive complexity, finite model theory, and, and building bridges between these uh, areas uh, of uh, complexity theory and logic. And he has won many, many awards for his work. Um, and today, uh, Albert is going to talk about uh, the past and present of descriptive complexity theory, so his take on on the whole field. So without further ado, Albert, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Vijay, for the introduction. And thank you everybody for joining. So indeed, I'm going to talk about past and present of descriptive complexity theory. Initially, the title had future, but uh, I cannot predict the future, so I removed that from the title. And many of the things that I'm going to talk about are survey and uh, they don't include results of my own. In fact, many of the things go back to before the time I was born, like uh, for example, the Turing machine. So uh, my thesis in this talk is that uh, uh, descriptive complexity is really, uh, one way to see it is uh, by looking at the model of computation in which we're doing our algorithms. So let's remem remind ourselves what the Turing machine is. So the Turing machine works at the bit level. So it has the tape where you have some a cell that is uh, the current cell. And then the control has a set of instructions and the instructions that they do the usual thing, they read a symbol, and then they do three things depending on what the symbol is. Uh, they rewrite the symbol with another one, they move the head left or right, and they jump to another instruction in the instruction set. Now, crucially, the set of instructions is a finite uh, set. So this is a finite uh, machine. And it's operating at the bit level. And for that reason, many um, typically mathematicians tend to think that uh, this is not a natural model because it, uh, it doesn't have a sufficient structure to, to be able to analyze it mathematically. So, but in fact, it's not the only model of computation that works at the bit level. There is a, a very closely related model, in fact, which is the Boolean circuit. And this is what Shannon, in fact, very early in 1938, this was his master thesis in MIT, uh, he called relay and switching circuits. And this is a remarkable paper where he was talking about Boolean circuits and essentially the way we, we think of them today. So we have uh, some inputs that take Boolean uh, values, x1 to x5 in this example, and then you have some gates where you do some obvious computation, take two inputs and produces another output another bit as an output. And um, so one way to represent this uh, computation here is by the set of equations that you see on the right. So every gate gets a variable and then you um, express what is the uh, effect of the gate on its inputs. And Sharon himself analyzed it circuits this way. And what this is what we call in the satisfiability uh, uh, literature, we call it the Zetin transformation but uh, maybe it should be called the Shannon transformation because this is, Shannon used this to actually reason about the correctness and about uh, issues about the, about the circuit, exactly using Boolean logic this way. All right, so, so these are two models of competition. They are extremely, um, they are very well connected one with the other. There are transformations uh, from one to the other. But uh, the, the thing is that both are bit-based. They are based on uh, working with bits and uh, we now know, and we also already knew back in the 30s, but uh, at the time, um, I mean, the, the notion of uh, encodings was actually quite new. And, and this was one of the contributions of, of Gödel that things can be encoded at the bit level, right? But uh, we, we know that the data has structure. It's not, data is not just a bunch of bits. So data comes from something that we want to understand and analyze. So just graphs, it could be directed graphs or undirected graphs, it could be weighted, you could have hypergraphs where edges have more than more, one, two vertices, you could have graphs that have structure of a tree, 
partially ordered sets, even KCNR formulas, you can think of this, them as uh, structured data. So in this example, we have the clauses on the left, in this case, three clauses and the variables on the right. You have a bipartite graph with two types of edges, which denote occurrence. And the occurrence of red could mean, for example, that variable X1 appears in the clause in negative polarity and green would mean that it appears in positive polarity. So even though KCNF formulas are quite a low level representation of, uh, of data, they are still more structured than just uh, plain bit strings. Other type of uh, data which uh, we might want to manipulate are matrices, which also have some structure and we'll get back to it uh, later again. So if data has structure, then um, why do we break the structure completely and we turn it into bit strings? And that, that is actually a problem. And this was a problem that uh, at the beginning of database theory, um, Cod uh, realized uh, that there was this problem of how the databases are represented. And he introduced the model of relational model of data, the relational databases. And this was as early as 1970. And the model is the following. So, it clarified it uh, well it was a very uh, clean way of representing data comparing to what was at the time this was still before the time i was born so i'm just reading from from the papers so what is the relational model in the relational model we have some relations and this is your input and what are relations well these are just sets of tuples where a tuple is uh, well, a tuple so a bunch of elements from different domains and these domains uh, decide, uh, tell what is the type of this relation. This is how it's called. So here is an example on the right. You have a bipartite graph. You have two types of vertices, vertices uh, from some uh, string domain and then vertices from some numeric domain. And then you have some relation between them. And that relation is the edge relation in the bipartite graph. So in this example, the three, the three relations would be the set of vertices U, the set of vertices V and the relation of H E itself. Okay, so so Cot said uh, let's represent databases this way and with relations. And in fact, he he acknowledges that this goes back to Tarski uh, when he has this algebra of relations, and he introduces the concept of relational algebra and crediting Tarski for it. So he says. Okay, what can we do with these relations? We can manipulate them somehow, some ways, right? So we can do intersection of two relations, provided they are of the same type. We can do union of relations, provided they are of the same type. We can do set difference. We can do Cartesian products, where now the types concatenate. And then there are two special operations. One is the selection operation. This is called, denoted by sigma i and j. And what this represents are the tuples in the relation T, where i and j components are equal. This is the equal selection. And then we have projections, where in projections, we have, well, again, one component. And what you do is that you remove the element in that component. So you take all the tuples in T and you remove that component. So we say that we project I out of the relation. So these are the operations, the basic operations of the relational algebra. And Cod suggested that uh, uh, with databases represented in his relational model, um, data should be manipulated with this sort of uh, operations. So, and now we can uh, formulate what Cot uh, himself uh, talked um, called the relational algebra expressions. So this is again like uh, some sort of a circuit. Uh, it's written this way to, uh, to show the analogy. So but now the inputs are not bits, but they are relations themselves. So the whole relation is put as an input and the, you have the basic operations inside. So these are expressions in this algebra of relations. And again, you can do the intermediate relations and, and then you can measure the complexity of the expression by how wide these relations are, how, how many Cartesian products we do and this sort of uh, analysis that we will do. Good, so these are relational algebra expressions. And then, um, so Cot related uh, this to something quite familiar, which is the, the first order logic on, on, uh, on a relational language. So he noticed and he proved uh, that relational algebra can compute precisely the same relations from, from given relations, it can compute the same relations that you can define with first order logic. Intersection corresponds to conjunction, union corresponds to, to disjunction, 
difference corresponds to negation. Uh, this sigma, this selection is the equality relation, which we usually assume given for free. And the projection is precisely the existential quantification. Where now these variables range over the domains of our uh, data model. Uh, by the way, once you have negation and existential quantification, you also have uh, universal quantification. One thing to notice is that uh, the relational algebra is variable free. There are no variables. The, uh, there are no individual variables. So what you're operating with is relations directly. In particular, you're not doing any choices. So when, when you do uh, an intersection, you apply the intersection to both relations, to every tuple in the, in the relation. And when you do a projection, you apply the projection to every tuple in the relation. You're not working individually with elements or tuples of your structure. And this is important because choice-free uh, computation is what we're after in domains like databases and in other places. And that's a bit my point here. So, so before I go to, to what descriptive complexity brought uh, into the picture of complexity theory, so let me make a, a one comment, that, which is the comment of between uniformity and non-uniformity. So one thing to notice in the difference between Boolean circuits and uh, relational algebra expressions is that a single expression or a single formula can serve all inputs of a given type. So here's an example. If you want to define for a given graph this, the vertices or the set of vertices that belong to a triangle, then you have this single formula. This is a finite object with uh, 25 symbols or something, where you're saying x is in the relation that you're trying to define if there are two vertices that form a triangle, one of which is x. Yes? So that's a first order formula. And this single first order formula of uh, finite uh, set of symbols serves all input graphs. And these input graphs are now our input relations. So in this sense, it's a uniform model, but we could also imagine that we have a non-uniform model of computation where we could have, for example, a different relational algebra expression for different input lengths. This is an approach that is actually quite useful, but uh, it's not the one I'm following in this. And it's not the one traditionally followed in descriptive complexity. So, and because of today I want to focus on past and present of uh, descriptive complexity, we are, we are going to focus on the uniform model. These things are usually called queries. So this is a query on graphs. Uh, they are graphs because the types are uh, vertices and edges. Very good. So uniformity versus non-uniformity. And now there comes the issue of computability with relations. So we have the model of data, and now we want to say, how do we compute with these relations? Well, we already discussed the relational algebra, but is it uh, powerful enough? Is this model powerful enough? Well, Aho and Ullman uh, discussed this, and among many others, actually, uh, around the late 70s and early 80s, this was uh, an issue of discussion. But I think this quote here is, uh, pertinent given Ullman's recent Turing Award. So I think let's see what Ullman, Aho and Ullman said. The general consensus about the model of computation for relations is that one does not wish to have general Turing machine capabilities. So that's a bit funny thing to say. Uh, well, you don't want to, to be a Turing complete. So, uh, but there are reasons for that and they go ahead and discuss the reasons for it. And the results is these principles that they formulate, that they say that uh, um, we want this computation to be order independent, for example, that's one thing we want. And what does that mean is that, well, the way the relation is presented to you, the order in which the tuples are presented to the machine should not affect the output of the computation. And that's important for databases for because you want uh, representation independence of your queries. You, know, I mean, you want your queries to depend only on the truly structural data, not on the representation of the data. The second principle, which is totally quite related and it's a bit hard to distinguish one from the other, but uh, there is a bit of a difference is the isomorphism invariant. So here, what, uh, what they mean here is that if you rename the element, then the output should uh, only change up to the same renaming. In particular, and this is an important point, if a structure, if an input has a certain automorphism, if you can, meaning that you can exchange two elements in your structure and not notice the difference, then the output uh, should also have this automorphism. 
So this is an, an important concept for, for preserving the abstraction that is already in the input. And you want to preserve, you, you want this relational uh, structure. Okay, so this model of computation introduced, uh, or these principles of the model of computation introduced in the 70s um, was the guiding principle for, for, for databases. But then complexity theory also had something to say here. And so Fagin's theorem, in fact, is earlier. And Fagin's theorem, the way it can be interpreted is as a way to say that the isomorphic invariant of the iso invariant fragment of NP coincides precisely with existential second order logic. So what is, uh, what is existential second order logic? Well, you take a first order formula where you have some input relations and some auxiliary relations that are quantified existentially. And this is existential second order because this is first order and this is a second order relation. And it's existential because you don't quantify universally over second order relations. So Fagin's theorem is exactly this statement that I wrote here. And what makes it um, an interesting statement is that the thing on the left is really a semantic class, if you think of it as uh, just by itself, because the fact that the non-deterministic polynomial time machine computes an isomorphism invariant property is not even a decidable condition. And this is not something you can impose on the machine by just uh, putting a clock. For example, the fact that the machine runs in polynomial time is not a decidable condition either, but you can enforce it by just putting a clock. But here, isomorphism invariant is not something you can enforce by such a simple device. But in fact, you do, you can enforce it because this is class of existential second order logic is a syntactic class. It's a syntactic meaning that the set of formulas that you are allowed to use are clearly the size of set. So, so the, your devices are, are the size. Okay, so this is characterizing a semantic class in terms of a syntactic class, and that's what makes it interesting. In one direction, uh, the reason it works is that you have the power to guess uh, these existential quantifiers. And the other direction from, from machines to existential second order logic, in fact, is nothing else than Cook's theorem done in sufficiently abstract way so that uh, you preserve the automorphisms. Good, so this is Fagin's theorem, it's already covered, so let's move on. So here's the zoo. Uh, nobody likes zoos, I think, uh, or very few people like zoos, but I think zoos at least have a good thing. It's that at least they are not jungles, right? I mean, they are organized. So, so here's what we call logics zoo in the same way that there is the complexity class zoo. So let me give you a map of how to read this. So down here, we have complexity classes from the complexity zoo. And up here, we have a bunch of logics that correspond more or less to these classes. So for example, here in this uh, cage, uh, this green cage here, we have NP, which is completely characterized by existential second order logic. And in fact, this characterization can also be done for the polynomial hierarchy where you go to full second order logic you could even do it for P space in exponential time by looking at proper uh, that certain extension of second order logic. Albert, yes. Can I ask a very naive question? Yes. When you say that existential second order logic is the same thing as NP, like NP deals with languages and whether strings are in languages. So what are our strings in our languages? Is it like whether a structure somehow satisfies a sentence, or or how should I think about this? Yeah, good, good question, thank you. So by this, what I mean is the language encoding the relation. So the inputs are really relations, but they are somehow encoded. And now what I want to say is that uh, a language, so uh, a collection of structures, meaning of relations, is accepted by your machine if the encoding is accepted by a certain machine. Okay, so it's the encoding itself. But what you want is that this machine is isomorphic invariant meaning that uh, two encodings of the same structure up to isomorphism should be accepted both or rejected both. So really the thing goes through encodings. Encodings are as, bit, as bit strings, but what you wanted is that these encodings are either, if two encodings represent the same structure up to isomorphism, then either both are accepted or both are rejected. Okay, but I can think of this as like my, my favorite NP complete graph problem. What Fagan says that there is like an, 
a logical sentence exists x and then some phi which sort of nails down exactly the graphs that have this property that make them yes instances. Absolutely, yes. Okay, yes. thank you so much. Thanks to you. All right, so here's my zoo again. And so let me give you this thing. So we have first order logic down here and existential second order here. And we have, um, um, okay, so this question marks, what do I mean here? Well, they have question marks because we don't know of a logic that corresponds exactly to isomorphism invariant polynomial time. In the same way that we know a logic that corresponds to isomorphism invariant NP, we don't know one for polynomial time, we don't know one for non-deterministic non log space. So it seems to be that there is a dividing line between P and NP into the possibility, or at least as far as we know today, of uh, capturing precisely the isomorphism invariant fragment of that complexity class. For polynomial time, it's the most attempt. So I did this cage quite long because I wanted to show the fact that there, are, there have been several attempts. And the arrows that have a cross means that it's been proved that uh, they are not equivalent. And the arrows that don't have a cross mean that they are just simulations. So there are two logics that are particularly important, the fixed point logic and fixed point logic with counting. So fixed point logic with counting is the focus that I want to give here. It's quite close to polynomial time in a quite uh, clear sense and well understood. So let's, let's get into that. All right, so what is a fixed point logic? For, before I define FPC, I need to define FP. So FP stands for inflationary fixed point logic. Usually some people put an I in front, inflationary fixed point or fixed point just for short. What do we have in this logic? We have the usual things. We have inputs, we have equalities, quantification over elements into domains, Boolean connectives, and then we have an inflationary fixed point operator. What is that? Well, that's nothing else than iteration. That's what I wrote here on the left. So we have the usual things, input selection, projection, Boolean combination, and iteration. So what does it mean to iterate? Well, it's this very simple pseudo code. You start with the empty relation, and now you form the relation of tuples that uh, satisfy psi given the current relation, in this case, the empty set. And then while the new relation is not equal to the old relation, then you iterate. You update the new relation and then you update the new thing to be what you had before plus the new tuples that are satisfied, that satisfy psi. So this way you get new tuples and you iterate until this converges into some fixed point and that, that's what you output. Now, one thing to notice is that because it's inflationary, because each time we are adding new tuples, uh, this is going to be, um, this is going to converge, yes? And in fact, it converges in time, which is polynomial in the arity of the relation symbol R in this case, or X in this case. Uh, sorry, polynomial in the size of the input with exponent that is the arity of this relation, because there are no more elements to be added than that number. And now comes the immerman vardy theorem, what you may have heard, which is essentially saying that the deterministic polynomial time can be captured by inflationary fixed point logic, except that there is a big if. And the big if is that it requires the domains to be ordered and to allow this order on the relations, on the, on the, on the domain elements. So once you have this if, then this is no longer a semantic class because the isomorphism invariance becomes trivial because uh, if the domain is fixed by an order, then there is nothing you can, you can uh, permit within the same structure other than just changing the names. So the automorphisms become trivial and therefore it's no longer a semantic class. Still, this is a powerful tool. And in fact, we're going to see an application of it. But it's not solving the question of whether there is a logic for isomorphic invariant P. So the question that we want to ask is why do we insist, people ask, why do we insist on, on ordered domains? Why, why is that so important? Well, for one thing, Fagin's theorem doesn't need this, right? While P seems to require it, at least as far as we know today, and therefore there seems to be a fundamental difference here that we have to understand. This was the problem of a logic for, or a language for isomorphic invariant P raised by Chandra and Harrell. Another thing is that all problems of interest, as I already argued, are isomorphic invariant, even KCNF or KSAT and these sort of things. Um, they, they don't depend on, on automorphisms. If you flip two variables and that doesn't change the structure of the formula, it stays this variable. 
Another thing is that we want to look at choice because essentially having a linear order is like having a choice. You can always choose the least element in the order. You want to think of it as a computational resource in the same way that we think of random bits or quantum bits as a computational resource. And the question is how much of these resource is actually needed for, for efficient computation. And the last thing is that there is a program here that I want to highlight. And, and that was the whole point of this talk. So but before I get to the program, I need to say what is fixed point logic with counting and why do we need counting? So one thing is that uh, fixed point logic cannot do basic arithmetic with the cardinality of the structure, for example. It cannot even tell whether the structure has an even number of elements. This was recognized early on by Himmerman himself. And he said, okay, let's throw in quanti uh, quantification that allows us to count. In particular, he said, let's use a counting quantifiers of this type, where you say there are at least i elements x that satisfy psi, but now i is a variable that ranges over some special number domain, which we allow, which we assume is given in the input, uh, and we allow some arithmetic on this number domain. The whole point is that this number domain and the other domain, the domain of actual structures, are only connected through these quantifiers. So there is no way to order the elements in the, in the given structure by the order that you have in this uh, arithmetic because there is no way to connect them one with the other. You don't have a, you don't have a bijection between them. So let me give an example of how you do fixed point logic with counting. You can do quite sophisticated things. This is a basic one first. So let's count walks in graphs. So suppose we're given a graph on some vertices. This is an adjacency matrix. You can think of it as a zero one matrix with indices, the vertices of your graph. And now how do we say that there is a walk of length two? Well, that's the squaring of the matrix. So or rather we want to count how many walks of length two we have. So we sum over all Ws or intermediate points and then we take the product. Right? One thing to notice that is that this is isomorphic invariant. If you permit the Ws, then the, because the matrix uh, also permutes, then you're getting uh, you're getting the same count. Now, once once you can do paths of length two, you can do paths of uh, any power of two by iteration, and this is what you do with the fixed point iterator. By the way, here I'm counting exactly i, right? Saying there are at least i, and there are not i plus one. So this is quite a powerful uh, way to to compute things. For example. So here is the list of uh, things that you can do with uh, fixed point logic with counting. You can do connectivity queries. This you can already do in fixed point logic. You can do two sat. You can decide the satisfiability of a two CNF formula. You can decide whether a CNF formula has a bounded width a resolution refutation for some fixed width. You can design horn sat. You can execute unit cross propagation, which is essentially the same as horn sat satisfiability. So, these are things you can already do with fixed point. Now, once you add counting, you can start doing things like perfect matching of bipartite graphs. And you can do matrix non-singularity over finite fields. You can do algebraic uh, things. You can also do determinants over the rational numbers. You can solve linear systems of equations. You can do linear programming. You can do perfect matchings on general graphs. You can even do the ellipsoid method. So it becomes a very, very wide fragment of polynomial time for which we actually know how to prove lower bounds. So it can do all this, but at the same time, we can show that it cannot do certain other things. But the focus of this talk is not on lower bounds. I would be happy to give another talk on, on lower bounds and Adam Foyt Fresse games and all that goes into them, which is beautiful results. But today I want to focus on upper bounds. So let me tell you how to do determinants, for example. So how do you do determinants in a way that preserves the isomorphism of, of uh, of the adjacency or of the matrix. So you have a matrix of rational numbers. And let's say they are 0, 1 entries just for simplicity. They can be just any rational numbers. Think of a, an adjacency matrix. Now the determinant of this matrix, you can, you can express it by the, the, the usual formula. And if you look at it, it happens to be isomorphic invariant. But that doesn't mean you can compute it in polynomial time in isomorphic invariant way, because that's an exponential big sum. So the question is whether you can compute determinants of rational numbers in FPC. And here computing you, what you want is to compute the value as a binary relation that, uh, as a relation that encodes the binary bits, the bits of the input. 
So one warning is that Gaussian elimination, as a, this is a fantastic algorithm that is used all the time, it's not good for us. It's not the, the, the choice, the, the choosing a pivot is not something we can do because when we choose a pivot, we're breaking symmetries. So Gaussian elimination is not available. But the nice thing is that there are alternatives. So Leverrier method, for example, if you are in characteristic zero, you can express the determinant of, I mean, the, the characteristic polynomial of the matrix with a recurrence, uh, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial can be expressed as a recurrence that depends only on the trace of the powers of the matrices. But the powers of the matrices, we already said how to do in FPC, so it's available in FPC. And the rest is just a recurrence of some basic arithmetic that you are allowed to do in, 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 in fixed point logic. What about the trace? Well, well, the trace is just the sum of the diagonal elements. And the diagonal is, of course, definable because it's just the selection of the entries of the matrix with equal indices. That's exactly the sigma. So you select the, 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 the diagonal, you add them up, you add the whole diagonal. That's expressible in FPC. Therefore, you can express the coefficients. And once you have the coefficients, you plug zero and you get to the terminal of A. Now I'm a bit out of time, so no, I don't have time to discuss linear programming. It's a beautiful algorithm for doing linear programming due to Anderson, Dawar, and Holm. It's based on refining the ellipsoid method. I don't have time to discuss this. So it's a beautiful, beautiful algorithm. So instead of that, let me finish with a couple of slides of uh, some directions of fetal work that I think could be done here. So there's a program here that one can put forward, which is that, um, okay, we have this very big fragment of polynomial time computation. It can do many things. It cannot, certain things it cannot do, like solving systems of linear equations over finite fields. So that it can do. It can do for characteristic zero, it can do for many other things. So it's a big fragment. And now the problem is that to prove the predictions that complexity theory conjectures do, but do that, prove it unconditionally. And by the predictions, I mean that I don't want, I don't pretend to prove the complexity theoretic conjecture itself, but whatever is predicted by this conjecture. So here is an example. So I put it in abstract terms, but you can concrete, you can put it uh, in concrete terms, unique games conjecture. Well, let's put it in abstract terms. Conjecture X says that problem Y is hard. Okay, that's exactly what the unique game conjecture says. So now you want to show that the family Z of algorithms, so a huge family of algorithms that you are interested in, things that come from proof complexity, things that come from um, optimization, sum of squares algorithms, whatever you have in mind. You want to show that this family of algorithms cannot refute the conjecture X, and you want to do it unconditionally, because this is predicted by the conjecture. So the way to do it is you show that the algorithms in this family Z are definable in FPC. And then by reductions in the end, you can show that uh, the, uh, you, you can show that in fact, uh, these algorithms cannot solve this thing and therefore, uh, and, and you did that unconditionally. Now for the unique games conjecture, there is some initial work uh, by Jamie Tucker Foltz. Uh, this is a very recent paper that is very interesting and it, does, it doesn't solve the unique games conjecture for the algorithms of FPC. For, but it, it makes some good progress. For hardness of approximation, like uh, max 3 sat and max x or sat and all that, we did it with Anush Dawar a couple of years ago. And uh, finally, one last example that connects to the next talk is uh, uh, the following. So again, within this program, suppose you want to prove lower bounds for a proof system X. What do you need to do? Well, one thing you can do is show that the proof search algorithm for this the restricted complexity proof search algorithm for this is expressible in FPC. And in fact, this is one way, and uh, Joanna Kremiak in her talk uh, earlier in this series uh, talked about this approach to proving lower bounds. And this is precisely the, the topic that uh, Benedict Pago is going to tell us about in the next talk. So why would that be enough? Well, because you prove, uh, so you want to say, suppose that a certain formula is uh, easy for proof system X. Well, then uh, this FPC formula will be able to find the proof because you're sure that the proof search is doable in FPC. 
But on the other hand, uh, you know that some formulas are hard to distinguish in FPC from uh, unsatisfiable formulas are hard to distinguish from satisfiable ones. So it could not have had a small proof in the first place. So this way of proving lower bounds has actually been put to work and, and I insist this is what Benedict is going to tell us about. So I'll stop here and I think I'm a bit over time. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Albert, for an amazing talk. Um, questions, please. I have a question. Go ahead. Or a comment. So uh, with Abul and Vianu and me, we introduced a kind of an intermediate model of a relational machine. Yeah. That, that in some sense, it really tries more to say, how do we compute those relations and without having to know logic, so to speak. So you, you basically says, okay, suppose we have write programs that, that can use relational alg algebra. And then we are able to show kind of tight connections to this, to, to the logic. Yeah, I'm aware of your work. In fact, it was there, it cited at one place, but I was running out of time. So I decided to uh, reflect, to, to, to go back to pot and to relational algebra. But I'm aware of your model. And uh, yeah, it's definitely, in fact, in the abstract, I even talked about relational machines and this thing, this is your, your terminology, relational machine. Yeah. So basically, yeah. you, have, you have a store of relations that you're allowed to manipulate through basically a Turing machine that has instructions that say what to do on the tape and what to do with the relations. And right, right. It's a beautiful model, it's, it's useful. Maybe. It's not been very influential for some reason. Yeah. There's a question by Valentin. Um, is there a non-uniform version of FMT that can talk about circuits? Yes, absolutely. This is an excellent question. It's something I wanted to talk about too. So I, I focused on, on the uniform model because that's how uh, most of descriptive complexity in the early times was developed. But the non-uniform model makes perfect sense. And all the lower bounds, in fact, are for the non-uniform model. So why is that? So first of all, what is the model? The model is that now we have, uh, you can imagine you have a fixed point formula or even first order formula, it doesn't matter because you can look at them as uh, unrolled. And you have one different formula for each input line, input size. So for graphs of size 25, you have a formula. For graphs of size 26, you have another formula. And the only condition you put on these formulas is that they should all be in size bounded by some polynomial, for example, or some exponential even, or some sub-exponential function. And now the lower bounds for proof com for descriptive complexity, they work in the non-uniform setting because the way they are proved is by showing that you have two graphs that look very similar and yet they are indistinguishable by formulas of certain size or certain, certain width to be more precise. And that depends only on the size of the graphs. I mean, you don't need to have infinitely many graphs to play around. You have only two graphs of a certain size and you play the RM for a second to show that they are indistinguishable. And therefore, uh, you can construct infinite families of such graphs, one for every input size, and therefore you get your lower bounds. Now, the thing is that the lower bound you get is for circuits that satisfy a symmetry condition. They are not arbitrary Boolean circuits, they are symmetric Boolean circuits. And this is the topic of my talk in uh, a few weeks ago, I gave in the seminar. And uh, Anus Dawar also gave a talk on this concept of symmetric circuits. So we get lower bounds for non-uniform symmetric circuits. Exponential lower bounds. Here. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so I had one question. Uh, if you may go back one slide or, or the last slide where you showed the the um, yeah so I, I'm trying to understand what you're saying here so you're saying that um, FPC is this restricted uh, version it doesn't completely characterize P right it characterizes some large fragment of P and if you show that proof search for a proof system X is easy by showing that uh, uh, proof search is in this FPC then that would in turn, imply that uh, it, it, the the, the uh, size lower bound on proof system X. Basically, basically that's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. 
what, awesome. what would be a bit confusing is how can proof search be easy if they are all hard, right? They are all NP hard, more or less. Well, here, because I'm thinking of proof search for proof systems like uh, bonded with resolution. There, that is easy. I mean, it, the only thing is that it depends on the parameter. So you have, for with W, you get time N to the W. But that's okay, because we have lower bounds that are exponential. So if proof search in N to the W can be done in FPC with W variables, that's the te terminology that has been used. So if you can do it with W variables, then a lower bound for W variables will give you a lower bound for, for with W. So it, it's, all of these things actually match very well. Um, I had one more question at the very beginning of the talk you mentioned that um, the correspondence between relations and first order logic, um, and you said that the, the relational algebra that you showed there is variable free. Now this would be true for finite relations, right? Is it also true for- Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah so I forgot to say this is finite relations. Only. Okay, yeah, that's- It's important. By, yeah. It's finite model theory, it's finite relations. Only. All right, okay, yeah, I mean, good. Well, in Thank fact, this, this very relation, this holds for infinite ones as well, but uh, for infinite domains, but not everything goes through. So yeah. for example, in this zoo, this is quite interesting. Uh, so least fixed point logic and positive least fixed point logic. So this is, you don't allow negations on the fixed point operators. So these two things in finite structures, they happen to be equivalent. So they are closed. So we say that least fixed point is closed under complementation. But for infinite structures, this is not true. So, so this is a theorem of, by Immerman, by the way, it's a theorem of finite structures, of finite model theory. Thank you very much. That was a very enlightening talk. Thank you, Albert. And that, the very last slide actually takes us to the next talk by Benedict. So Benedict, if you could share your screen, please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, so yeah, Benedict uh, is going to talk about a final finite model theoretic view of propositional complexity. Allow me to uh, just give a, um, a little bit of an, a bio of uh, uh, Benedict. He's a PhD student in Eric Grill's group at Auckland University. And he's going to present this work that he actually did as part of his bachelor's thesis. And he broadly works in the space of descriptive complexity and finite model theory. So without further delay, Benedict, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a talk about this um, paper that I did a few years ago with Erich Gredel, Martin Bohr, and Vitva Kusa. Um, and as the title says, um, you know, what we did in this work was to establish certain interesting connections between finite model theory and propositional proof complexity. And so what do these two fields have to do with each other? So in proof complexity, um, people study proof systems, so um, sets of inference rules that allow to refute unsatisfiable uh, propositional formulas. And one main example of this is the resolution calculus. And one is interested in the size or the complexity of um, refutations depending on the formula that you're refuting. Um, and in finite model theory, at least in this context, we're interested in uh, the expressive power of fixed point logics on finite structures. Uh, yeah, and Albert has already said a bit about fixed point logics. So these are extensions of first order logics, a first order logic that allow um, yeah, to express algorithms and iteration. And um, yeah, so when I say finite structures, you can always think of graphs or colored graphs or th things like that. Um, and so how do we bring these two things together? So it turns out that um, actually these two formalisms, so proof systems and fixed point logics, can mutually simulate each other, uh, provided that we use a, a suitable translation between the two, two worlds. So we have to somehow translate between graphs and propositional formulas. And then the simulation um, preserves complexity. Uh, so that's why um, one of the main applications of this is that now we can transfer lower bound results that are known already um, between the two areas of research. Um, okay, so the overview of the paper and of this talk is basically this. So the two proof systems that we studied were the resolution calculus 
and uh, the so-called polynomial calculus, which is an algebraic proof system. And we related them to these um, two fixed point logics respectively. Uh, yeah, and in the end, I'll also tell you something about the, the lower bound applications that I mentioned. Uh, so in particular, how do we, um, how can we use known lower bounds from finite model theory to also get lower bounds for proof complexity? Um, okay, so let's start with the resolution. So this is probably, yeah, quite well known. Um, so this is a standard proof calculus for um, refuting unsatisfiable propositional formulas, um, which are given in conjunctive normal form, so as a set of clauses. And um, a CNF formula is unsatisfiable if and only if the empty clause can be derived from it using only this uh, resolution rule. So we only have one inference rule in this calculus. Uh, yeah, and the rule says if you have two clauses where in one of them you have X and in the other one you have not X, then you can uh, yeah, unify the clauses and throw away the conflicting literal. Mm. And this calculus is sound and complete, so you can refute any unsatisfiable formula. But of course, the refutation uh, may be very large in general, because uh, if you always found a short refutation, then the satisfiability problem would be in P or so, so um, that can't be the case. Um, and so we want to measure the complexity of a refutation somehow. And there are two, let's say, main complexity measures. Um, one is the size of the refutation, so that's the total number of clauses that you need. And there's also another way to measure it, um, namely you can look at the width. So that's the, um, the size of the largest clause uh, in a refutation. Okay, so, so much for resolution. And um, the logic that we um, related this to um, is least fixed point logic, um, or LFP. And uh, yeah, as already mentioned, um, this is an extension of um, classical first order logic by a mechanism to um, express iteration. Um, and this is done using um, so-called fixed point formulas, which look like this. Um, and yeah, they have a free variable. And um, to express this fixed point iteration, uh, we use a second order variable, which is R in this case. And so this can take as values subsets of the universe of the structure. And then um, evaluating a fixed point formula means that we have to form this, this fixed point uh, which is a, yeah, a sequence of um, subsets of the universe. And there is this update formula phi, which says uh, how to update this fixed point in each step. So more precisely, uh, the semantics is this. So if we have a structure A um, and an element a small a from the universe, then this satisfies such a fixed point formula if and only if this element A is in the least fixed point um, of this sequence. Yeah, so the sequence starts with uh, the empty set as the value of R, and then uh, the value of R i plus one is always um, the set of all elements in the structure which satisfy the update formula with respect to the previous stage of the iteration. Uh, and I'll also show you an example in a minute. Uh, and essentially, one can prove that um, the sequence of sets that is defined in this way is always monotonically increasing. And uh, at some point, we'll always reach a fixed point uh, where it doesn't change anymore. Yeah, um, and that's the least fixed point. And so this uh, has well-defined semantics and um, yeah, can be used to express iteration. Um, yeah, and the expressive power of this logic is somewhere between that of first order logic and P time. Uh, so in particular, all these fixed point iterations will terminate after a polynomial number of steps. Um, so when we relate this to um, the resolution calculus, it's already clear that we will not um, get resolution in total, but we can only relate this to a fragment of resolution where the proofs are guaranteed to have polynomial size, because otherwise uh, it's clear that we couldn't do proof search in a p-time formalism. And um, yeah, to get a feeling for this, um, yeah, why there is this intuitive connection between fixed point logic and um, resolution, we can now consider an easy problem uh, as an example. So um, yeah, this is the reachability problem on graphs. So the input is just a directed graph with two distinguished vertices, S and T. And the question is, is there a path from S to T? Uh, and it's, yeah, it's quite clear that this cannot be um, expressed in first order logic because there is no mechanism to, to express transitive closures. 
Um, but in least fixed point logic, we can um, express this by the sentence that is depicted there. Um, so the idea is we use this um, second order variable R to stand for the set of all vertices which are reachable from S. Um, and the fixed point update formula says in each step we add to R um, each vertex X, which is either equal to S, so that's the base case, or which has a predecessor that is already in R. And it's quite clear, uh, I think, that this, um, the fixed point of this formula is exactly the set of all reachable vertices. Um, so the computation proceeds as follows. So we start with the empty set. Then at first we add the vertex S because that's the only one satisfying the update formula. And then we proceed by always adding the successors. So uh, this fixed point iteration essentially simulates a breadth first search in graphs yeah, like this. And then this is clearly the fixed point because you can't add anything more. And then you see, okay, T is in the fixed point. So the formula evaluates to true. Um, okay, so that, this is the, the fixed point logic view on this problem. Um, and now it, uh, it turns out that in resolution, um, what happens if you encode this problem in, res in resolution uh, is very similar and somehow um, directly simulates this fixed point induction. Um, namely, if we encode this, um, as a resolution problem, uh, the natural way to do this would be like this. So we take a set of propositional clauses, which is unsatisfiable if and only if there is a path from S to T. And um, so we use for each um, vertex in the graph, a propositional variable. Um, and the meaning should be that uh, the variable must be set to one if it is reachable from S. So this is in fact a Horn formula whose minimum model is the set of all reachable vertices. Uh, so for each edge, we have such an implication that says, uh, if the predecessor is reachable, then also the successor is reachable. And in the end, we have this not xt, which says, um, yeah, which is that, so that the formula is unsatisfiable if and only if t is reachable. And um, now the interesting thing is, if we refute this formula in the re resolution calculus, then somehow this resolution um, proceeds the same way as the fixed point induction we saw before. So in the first resolution round, so to speak, we can get xv and xw, meaning in one step we can reach v and w. And then in the second round of resolution, um, we can obtain um, xt. Yeah, and then we can get the empty clause as well. Uh, and so in this case, uh, yeah, the um, clauses that we resolve um, appear in the same order as, as breadth first search would do in this graph and as the fixed point induction proceeds. So in this example, you see um, that somehow resolution directly simulates fixed point iteration. Um, and now, of course, the question is, does this generally hold that you get this nice um, correspondence? And uh, the answer is yes. But of course, it also depends on the encoding. So we should first of all say how we translate this, this graph into a set of propositional clauses. Um, so you see in this example, the set of propositional clauses um, is structurally isomorphic to the graph somehow. So uh, you have propositional variables corresponding to the uh, vertices and the edges correspond to these implication clauses. Uh, so this translation is extremely simple and that's somehow what we want in general. So um, to make this more formal, uh, the way uh, we translate arbitrary finite structures to CNF formulas is via um, so-called first order interpretations. Um, and so if you don't know uh, what this is, it suffices to think of it as um, a first order definable mapping between finite structures. So that means the elements of the image structure um, correspond to tuples of elements of the original structure. And the relations in the image structure are first order definable in the original structure. And um, most importantly, this means that um, Computing this reduction given by such an interpretation um, does not require any computational overhead. So you don't need recursion or fixed point induction to compute this. Um, and that's why this is somehow the natural choice of reduction that we use here, um, because we really want that this fixed point iteration is simulated by resolution and not by the reduction that is in between these two worlds. Yeah, so um, the way how we simulate fixed point formula in resolution is uh, we apply such an um, interpretation to the input structure for the fixed point formula. 
And uh, this gives us a CNF formula that we can use as the input for the proof system. Uh, and of course, this means that the CNF formula is again represented as a graph or a finite structure, um, but the concrete representation is not relevant. So this is clear that this can be done somehow. Um, okay, and with respect to this notion of reduction, uh, we get all our correspondence theorems between proof systems and fixed point logics. Yeah, so this is the first result, um, namely that LFP corresponds to resolution on Horn formulas. Um, so in detail, one direction is that for every um, fixed point sentence, there is a first order interpretation that just depends on that sentence, uh, which takes finite structures to Horn formulas, um, such that the structure is a model of the fixed point sentence, if and only if the Horn formula that you get uh, is unsatisfiable. Um, yeah, so this shows indeed the evaluation of fixed point formula, formulas um, can be done um, by resolution on Horn formulas. And the proof for this goes um, via certain model checking games for least fixed point logic. So um, yeah, I won't go too much into detail, but one can show or it is known that uh, on finite structures, checking whether a fixed point sentence is true reduces to um, solving uh, yeah, so-called reachability games. And this is very similar to the, uh, to the example of the reachability problem that I already showed you. Um, so in fact, this can be encoded as a Horn formula and that can be refuted in resolution. And uh, the other direction is also true. So it's not so difficult to write down a fixed point sentence, which uh, exactly expresses that a Horn formula has a refutation. Um, yeah, because the complexity of Horn resolution is quite low. And um, as I already said, uh, this process of iteratively um, resolving new clauses can be seen as a fixed point process itself. So yeah, this is why it's true. And maybe more interestingly, with the same reasoning, you can also get results for bounded width resolution. So this is the fragment of resolution where the width of the clause is bounded by a constant. And this corresponds to uh, a strict fragment of um, LFP uh, called existential LFP. Um, this is uh, like LFP, but now the fixed point formulas may not contain universal quantifiers. Uh, and this is also known as stratified data log, by the way. Um, yeah, and so this um, weaker version of fixed point logic can be simulated using only width three resolution. And conversely, for any k, width k resolution can also be expressed in this fixed point logic. Again, because if the width of the clauses is uh, at most constant, then the proof size is guaranteed to be polynomial because there are only polynomially many um, clauses you can resolve. Um, okay, yeah, so this finishes the case of resolution. And now uh, we go one step further and um, look at an algebraic proof system. And this means on the side of finite model theory that we add counting. So yeah, Albert has already talked about this. Um, fixed point logic with counting is simply the extension of LFP by so-called counting terms. Um, yeah, we won't go into the details, but essentially this means you can now count the number of satisfying assignments for formulas. Um, and uh, the, the expressive power of this logic is between LFP and P. Uh, so this is strictly stronger than LFP because one can show that LFP cannot count and this is sort of the fix for that. Um, yeah, and the evaluation of these formulas is still in P time. And yeah, it's a fragment of P. Um, and one should say that from the point of view of finite model theory, this is um, an extremely well studied and important logic. Um, so many combinatorial algorithms um, can be expressed in this logic. And therefore, it's, it's interesting to relate this to a proof system. Um, and the proof system that corresponds to it is the polynomial calculus. And this is now mm, not really a system for a, for a propositional satisfiability problem, but instead um, the problem is this. So the input is always a set of polynomials and they are multilinear. So that means uh, they are multivariate polynomials, but uh, each variable um, has an exponent at most one. Um, and the question is, does, does there exist a zero one assignment to the variables? that is a common zero of all these polynomials. Um, so in this sense, um, it's also kind of a propositional problem because we treat the variables as propositional variables in a sense. Um, and 
Now there is a derivation of the one polynomial from this input uh, polynomial set, uh, if and only if this uh, system of polynomials is unsatisfiable. So meaning if there is no common zero. Uh, and so the proof rules are just these two. So first of all, you can take arbitrary linear combinations of derived polynomials. Um, here, I should say that the coefficients come from some, uh, some field that you have to fix beforehand. So you can do this over different fields and depending on the field that you choose, you actually get a, a proof system with different power. Yeah, but okay, so this is the linear combination rule. And the second rule is you may multiply any polynomial that you have with a variable from the variable set. And um, yeah, as an example, let's say we have two polynomials, x, y minus one and x. And you can see that there is no common zero because yeah, if you have to set x to zero, but then also x, y is zero. So the first polynomial is then minus one. So there's no way to make them zero at the same time. And therefore there should be a derivation of the one polynomial. And this is easy in this case. So um, first of all, we can multiply the input polynomial x with y, then we get x, y. And then using the linear combination rule, we can um, yeah, take x, y and x, y minus one and get the one polynomial. Mm, yeah, so in this case, this works. And uh, this also works in general. So this is again, a sound and complete proof system. But again, the size of the refutations is what's interesting here. So quick, quick question. Can you go back a slide? Yes. Hmm? Can you go back one slide? Uh, so the variable X with which you multiply the polynomial F must not already, the, the, must not already appear in F, is it? Uh, yeah, you, it, it usually it should be um, from the input. I think you can also consider different settings, but uh, yeah, here we consider only variables which already appear in the input polynomials. Would it not then give you like uh, quadratic? Um, if F contains X already, would you not get X squared? And I thought that was- oh, um, Yes, I didn't mention there's always implicitly a rule which allows you to, which says something like um, X squared minus X equals zero. So you can always remove these, um, these squares with an extra proof rule that always exists. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, and so uh, the complexity is either again, the size of a refutation or um, correspondingly to the width in the case of a uh, resolution, you can consider the maximum degree of any polynomial that you derive. Mm. And one can say, uh, also the characteristic of the underlying field over which you do all this also affects the complexity. So there are sets of polynomials which are easy to refute over a certain finite field, but require a very large refutation of the rationals, for example. But in this setting, we always consider um, the rationals as the field. Um, and one thing that is very important to know is that um, bounding the degree um, has an effect. So if we bound the degree by a constant, then all this becomes algorithmically tractable. So um, you can exhaustively search for proofs in the k-degree polynomial calculus in polynomial time. Um, and this is essentially due to linear algebra. So um, the set of all derivable polynomials is always a vector space due to this linear combination rule. And um, so if the dimension of the vector space is polynomial, then we can apply the uh, so-called Gritma basis algorithm to solve this. So the trick is that we don't have to do explicitly derive all polynomials that we could derive, but we can always only consider a basis of that space. And therefore this is tractable in p-time. And this is also part of the reason why this theorem um, holds that we got. Um, yeah, namely the polynomial calculus of bounded degree corresponds um, exactly to FPC. So, uh, on finite structures, we can simulate any FPC sentence in the polynomial calculus over the rationals already in degree uh, two. And for any constant K, we can also exhaustively search for proofs in FPC, um, again, over the rationals. Mm. And yeah, the proof, so going from FPC to the polynomial calculus is again via model checking games. And these are now sort of reachability games um, with counting. So now not only the existence of a winning strategy or of a winning move is important, 
but also um, the number of winning moves that you have in a given position. Um, but these kinds of games can be solved in, in the polynomial calculus if you use um, a suitable encoding. And for the other direction, um, I already said there exists this um, Gridma basis algorithm, which exhaustively searches for proofs. And um, in case of uh, the rationals, we can implement this in FPC. Um, because yeah, I think Albert also mentioned this, that linear algebra over, over the rationals is somehow doable in FPC. But for finite fields, this is not possible. So this theorem really um, is only possible over the rationals. Uh, yeah, so this is the overview of results. So we saw these three variants of fixed point logic in increasing expressive power and up to these first order reductions, they are um, equivalent to these proof systems. And what's maybe funny is that um, on the proof system side, we considered resolution and the polynomial calculus, which are two completely different systems. But on the finite model theory side, this just corresponds to adding the ability to count to fixed point logic. So somehow polynomial calculus is like resolution with counting, you could say. Um, yeah, okay, so now um, there's still this part about the lower bounds. So the main goal here was to transfer um, well-known lower bounds from finite model theory to prove complexity. And um, so for this, we still have to specify how we measure complexity um, in finite model theory. And here we say the complexity of a finite structure is simply um, the number of first order variables required to identify the structure up to isomorphism. Uh, and this is a bit sloppy, but um, essentially you can always ask yourself, so what's the least complex first order sentence that uniquely describes the structure? Mm, and with this complexity measure, you can also write two structures, A and B are K equivalent, if they cannot be distinguished by any K variable sentence where sentence refers to fixed point logic now, um, or also first order logic. Mm. Uh, and the idea is that if we have um, two structures for which we can prove that they are sufficiently similar, so K equivalent, then this also carries over to the corresponding um, propositional formulas that we get using an FO interpretation. So then also in K width resolution or K degree polynomial calculus, uh, the corresponding um, formulas are indistinguishable. So either they both have a refutation or both don't have a refutation. Yeah, because if they um, were somehow distinguishable in the proof system, then using these simulation results, um, it would follow that they are also distinguishable in fixed point logic. But this is not the case. Um, yeah, so this is the, the argument here. And maybe the main example for that we got lower bounds for or reproved lower bounds for um, is the graph isomorphism problem. Um, so here you can exploit yeah, standard constructions from finite model theory. Uh, so the so-called CFI construction, which we can treat as a black box now, but it yields sequences of uh, yeah, non-isomorphic graphs of increasing size. But the fact that they are not isomorphic is very hard to tell from the point of view of logic. So they require a linear number of variables to be distinguished in fixed point logic. And if we use these graphs and take any interpretation that maps them, so maps pairs of graphs to propositional formulas, that express the existence of an isomorphism. Then um, using the reasoning that I uh, already mentioned, um, we can infer that the width or the, the degree that is required to refute um, the corresponding isomorphism um, yeah, formula is at least linear. Because otherwise, if it were sublinear, then these structures could also be distinguished in fixed point logic with a sublinear number of variables. And from this one immediately gets that the size of the proofs is at least exponential because uh, this is a well-known relationship um, from proof complexity that the size of, of a proof is uh, always exponential in the, in the width or the degree. Mm, yeah, and all this is not new. So these things uh, had already been known, these lower bounds, um, but now we have this yeah, unifying framework for proving them. And also this is more independent of the encoding of the graph isomorphism problem because our results hold for any encoding um, up to first order interpretations. And lastly, one can say that also other lower bounds from proof complexity can be reproved uh, using these methods. So for example, well-known exponential lower bounds for resolution um, for the pigeonhole principle and the three colorability problem for graphs um, yeah, can also be now inferred from um, finite model theory. Yeah, so that's it.
Thank you, Benedict, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Questions, please. So for pigeonhole and three colorability, you can't get anything for uh, that would translate into polynomial calculus lower bounds? Um, I don't think that we did this, but uh, that should probably also work, yes. Other questions? Pavel, do you have I a have question? a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Vijay. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so, Albert uh, and Fokir and I have looked at defined something called uh, CSP proofs, consensus satisfaction proofs. And in some sense, the closing to final model theory because you're really working more directly with relations there. And you could define there the notion of bounded width proof, which I don't know if we define, I don't think we define it, but you could define easily define the concept of, of a bounded width proof there. And it would be interesting to see how, I don't think we, so the relationship there again to, to, to LFP has not been worked out. It would be interesting to see how it fits in this picture. Oh, okay. So what do you mean? I think I'm not aware of this work. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you a pointer later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There are two questions in the chat. Uh, Antonina asked the question, in the paper you mentioned a normal form for the structure used in the last proof. Could you say a bit about it? Um, normal form for the structures. Um, wait, which normal form I think, do you I think, mean? Uh, Antonina, are you referring to the... Um, you, you can unmute yourself and ask the question, but are you referring to the graph isomorphism? Was that uh, uh, I tend to remember that in one of the proofs you define the norm uh, operating. You talk about normal forms of the structure, and that allows you to get around the CFI construction. And um, I was I found it very interesting. And if you could say something about it, that would be great. Um. But, uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, take this. Uh, hmm? Jan Johansson has a question. Is there a relationship between the resolution width and the arity of fixed point operators in here? Uh, well, there's certainly a relationship between the number of first order variables that you use in this formula, but um, between the arity, yes, probably. Probably too, because I mean the arity of these fixed point um, operators somehow corresponds to the to the resolution width in the in the natural way when you simulate it. Um, but I don't know if, if you can um, formally show this. Uh, yeah. Igor Oliveira asks: Is there any hope? Lots of questions actually. Is there <laughs> any hope that stronger proof systems can be captured in this way? Um, beyond uh, yeah so I tried this um, to extend this to um, so I don't know if you know the logic choiceless polynomial time so that's another extension of um, fixed point logic with counting which is um, strictly stronger and I tried whether this logic can also be captured by a proof system in this way but that only worked in one direction so um, the proof system that um, somehow corresponds to this is um, uh, extended polynomial calculus. So that's a version of polynomial calculus where still the, the um, degree is bounded by a constant, but you may use extra variables in the proof to abbreviate um, high degree polynomials in some mm -hmm. sense. And that's a stronger proof system, but it does not um, correspond to, uh, to choices polynomial time in both directions. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if, if this nice correspondence really works for, for stronger proof systems as well. Yeah, maybe not. A couple of more questions. So Massimo Loria asks, there is a map from width k resolution to LFP and LLFP to width three resolution, but width three is weaker than width k. Is there something going on in the encoding? Similar uh, yeah, for the yeah, polynomial so, calculus. Um, yeah, this is because uh, the encoding is um, yeah via these first order interpretations. And so, Basically, this width gap is somehow hidden in the in yeah in the reduction between um, 
going back and forth between finite structures and these um, encodings. Um, so the first order interpretation basically does the bridges the gap between the width. Thomas uh, Kotman asks, uh, you mentioned horn unset. How about horn set, which is P complete? LFP simulates horn unset and LFP is strictly weaker than P. So horn unset is strictly weaker than horn set. Um, wait, aren't horn unset and horn set the same? Um, yeah, I don't think I can answer this directly, sorry. Um. Pavel asked the question, how do you prove the lower bound on the pigeonhole principle formulas? The formula has large width. Um, yeah, you take structures which, so you take some ordered structures which essentially encode um, the pigeonhole principle um, and then you have to show that the structure that corresponds to mapping n pigeons to n holes and the structure that corresponds to mapping n plus one pigeons to n holes, that these structures cannot be distinguished using less than n variables in first order logic. Uh, okay, um, but uh, I, what I don't understand is uh, you said that you use uh, width and degree to, to get uh, size lower bounds. So in, in the case of the of uh, the pigeonhole principle, uh, you cannot do it directly uh, because the, the width of the formula itself is already large. Right, right, that's true. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Um, okay, then I would have to check that again uh, if that's even um, correct. <laughs> Quick question, Benedict. Were you able to prove any new lower bounds that were not previously known, like new classes of formulas? Mm, no. So at least not so far. So Another question really from Massimo. Yeah, is, there any low, so mm -hmm. is there any lower bound in finite model for random structure? Um, hmm. What would random structure mean though? Massimo, I would really like to get such lower bounds for PC. Uh, I can unmute um, myself. Yes, go ahead, please. No, I mean, uh, I, for example, we know for uh, the lower bound for three colorability for uh, resolution of uh, random graphs. Uh, we don't know lower bound for three colorability for a uh, random graph. We only know for uh, uh, specific worst case constructions. So uh, if we could prove uh, a lower bound for three colorability over random graphs, uh, for example, in the FPC, then uh, I, I would understand that we would get a lower bound for random, for random graph in polynomial calculus. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, I, ha I haven't looked at this, but um, this might be worthwhile to think about then. So you're saying um, there is no known lower bound for random graphs uh, for three colorability for the polynomial calculus? Or? No, only for resolution. I mean, ah, the three colorability, okay. K color, uh, I, I, I don't know the number precisely, but uh, if you take a random graph, uh, a random, uh, random D regular graph, that would be hard for sort of uh, D over log D colors. I mean, you, you have to basically choose the number precisely, but somehow you have hard instances for three colorability if you take a random D regular graph for the right value of D, say. Uh -huh. and, okay, uh, so yeah, if a, one counts such graphs. Uh, in the resolution, we know, uh, so we, we know these lower bounds, but we don't know them for uh, polynomial calculus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe it would be a way to go to try and find such graphs that, that are hard to distinguish in fixed point logic. That's cool. Thanks for that question, Massimo. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again, Benedict, for a great talk. And Oh, uh, Albert, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, just a comment on the random graph thing. That usually random graphs tend to be rigid and they don't have automorphisms. 
And therefore, and even what tends to happen is that you can define a linear order on them with the logic, and then the lower bounds tend to break. On the other hand, there is a construction known as the multi pits construction, which uh, uh, is a random construction and it gives lower bounds for FPC. So this is this is due to Gurevich and Shela. And it has not been, yeah, it's something to look at. I know exactly why you're asking this, Massimo, and I think it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Benedict. Um, so, uh, Antonina, can you please share your screen while I introduce you? So now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Antonina Kolokolova. Uh, Antonina is one of those theorists who is interested in many different things, not only proof complexity, but also in the practical side of uh, you know, solvers, for example. So I've had the pleasure of working with her on many papers together. And she's also interested in the connections between theory and neuroscience. She's well known for her work in proof complexity. And she did her PhD under the supervision of Stephen Cook and is currently a professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland. So without further ado, Antonina, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Vijay. Okay, so, um, and uh, thank you so much, Albert and Benedict, for spectacular talks. It was so cool to listen to you. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, one more line of connections, kind of in the opposite direction from what Benedict talked about, not from proof complexity into um, uh, find model theory, well, with proving things and going back, but uh, how we could take results in descriptive complexity and actually build reasoning systems on top of them. So uh, basically, uh, we have uh, kind of three realms in which you talk about problems. One of them is uh, the search problems for example, how hard it is to find the path in a graph. Another one, uh, the one that you've just heard a lot about is uh, expressive power. What does it take to say that uh, the graph uh, is connected? But uh, the third side, uh, the one that shows up more in proof systems, what does it take to prove properties? For example, that reachability is transitive. And uh, Loosely speaking, those three realms would be your classical algorithmic complexity theory, descriptive complexity and finite model theory. And for the provability, uh, proof systems, as well as its uniform counterpart, bounded arithmetic. And uh, you've seen a lot about the relation between complexity and the find model theory today, descriptive complexity. You've seen uh, some of uh, translation from proof systems into descriptive complexity in Benedict's talk. And actually next week uh, in this workshop, next Wednesday, we are going to have a session on um, kind of mathematical foundations of SAT with talks going more into arithmetic and um, uh, probability and that side of thing. So what I want to talk about today is, um, is how uh, results proven in, uh, bound, uh, in descriptive complexity setting can let us build something in Let us build reasoning systems. So it's uh, this direction. So um, just uh, one caveat that uh, here, I'm just going to talk about the uniform classes and uniform system. Uh, there was a really nice uh, question about non-uniform side of finite model theory, but uh, 
what I want to focus on today is actually uniform side of finite model theory, because to me, in a way, some of those characterizations that Albert talked about are uniform counterparts to what we think about as the propositional satisfiability problem and friends. And in fact, um, Vegan theorem is kind of a counterpart of uh, Cook theorem, where rather than getting a class of formulas, you just get one formula uniform setting. So, um, and uh, another thing we need uniformity, we will be talking about uniform classes, even for very small classes. So we could talk about the class uniform, uh, Dillock time uniform AC0, uh, which has a very direct connection with uh, first order logic. So more precisely, uh, and I will define those things, um, what I want to show you today is how you could start with um, logics, in particular fragments of second order logic, with nice descriptive complexity characterization and use them to build theories with the same power. And uh, show what exactly you need to get theories of the same power from those characterizations. So you just heard Albert's talk, and uh, he was talking about the groundbreaking result in 74 of um, uh, Ron Fagan, who shown um, that NP corresponds precisely to existential second order. And the proof is again a variant of uh, Cook's theorem, except rather than generating a different formula for different um, input in front of the Turing machine, you actually have just one formula defining the tableau of the computation. And uh, this allows you to be in a setting where um, you could actually talk about one formula specifying a problem as opposed to a family of problems. So for example, in uh, proof complexity, we often talk about pigeonhole principle as a family, but here pigeonhole principle is just a single formula. Okay, so Fagan's um, characterization shows that without any assumptions on the underlying structure, um, NP corresponds to existential second order formulas. In 91, Eric Gradle extended it uh, to show uh, that um, subclasses of uh, second order logic, in particular, second order logic uh, where the formulas are of this form, also correspond to well defined complexity classes on structures containing successors. So, in particular, if you take existential second order formula of this form and you restrict the formula to be a horn formula, uh, where I guess the horn with respect to those um, P1 to PK predicates, then on successor structure, this logic captures exactly polynomial time. And when you restrict the formula to be 2CNF, uh, you could capture non-deterministic uh, uh, log space. And actually he had characterization for symmetric log space, for log space. It's a uh, it's really beautiful piece of work. Can you uh, define what you mean meant by um, horn over the predicates? Uh, so I just mean that uh, it's a CNF formula where every clause has at most one positive uh, occurrence of a predicate. Okay, got it. So you only consider those as uh, occurrences of the predicate as your variable, so to say, and then it's horn with respect to that. Mm -hmm. So another result, uh, by Barrington, Immerman, and Strobin, I think they might have been 
some earlier results by Immerman, but Barrington Immerman strobing gives a Dillard time uniform characterization shows that if you don't have second order quantifiers, then uh, you just have first order logic with uh, three second order variables, then you capture exactly the class AC0, the class of bounded depth circuits, which is probably the smallest complexity class that you hear people talking about. And the beauty of those characterizations is that uh, the correspondence is exact. If you prove the two logics are equivalent, the corresponding classes are, and vice versa. So as Albert was showing, there are lots of techniques that can be applied in this setting uh, to prove something about logic and then transfer it, well, to prove systems and so on. So in proof complexity, we tend to be more interested in proving tautology, so proving some statement, uh, rather than expressing statements. And uh, a natural question is, if you are operating with a class of formulas with precisely defined complexity, can you say something about the complexity of reasoning with those formulas? And um, actually, to me, it goes way back to the time when I was undergraduate and I came to Tony Petassi uh, asking to do some research with her. And she gave me two papers. One of them was Ron Fagan's uh, Finite Model Theory of Personal Perspective. And another one was Sam Bass's notes on uh, bounded arithmetic. So I read them, got very excited, came to Tony and said, Tony, so how do those two, how are those related? <laughs> how do you go from one to the other? There must be a connection. Well, I'm still stuck thinking about the connection many, many years after. So uh, let me just mention very few things about the history of the arithmetic side of it. And next week, we are going to have several talks that will cover this much better and in much more detail by uh, Sasha Radbora, Pavel Pudlak, and Shai Ben David. So I won't spend too much time on it. But uh, basically, um, piano arithmetic is probably one theory that people think about when they think about the um, uh, power of reasoning in um, power of reasoning in systems, unless you do bound, uh, unless you do reverse mathematics or something like that, piano arithmetic is one of the default theories that we reason about. And um, later on, people have defined uh, so, but piano arithmetic is very strong. It talks about things from computability realm rather than complexity realm. Um, in order to move things to closer to the efficiency question, Parik defined the bounded version of uh, piano arithmetic I delta zero. But this time it ended up being series that a little bit too weak. You just talk about linear time hierarchy and you can't quite go beyond it. Uh, then uh, Steve Cook have defined the theory PV originally as an equational theory, which was designed to capture polynomial time, exactly. He used Cobham's characterization of polynomial time, recursive characterization, to just de define polynomial time functions and operations with them. The theory was later extended, I think, by Krychuk to make, uh, to add a bit more Boolean stuff. And um, probably one of the main um, defining works in, uh, this area is Sam Bass's beautiful thesis called Bounded Arithmetic, where he defined, um, uh, well, he defined a lot of different theories corresponding uh, to various complexity classes and proved very interesting witnessing theorem. That is proof that uh, when you can prove something in a theory, then you know the 
complex, if you prove an existential statement in the theory of a certain form, then finding a weakness can be done by an algorithm of specific complexity and the algorithm kind of falls out of the proof. So uh, in bounded arithmetic, just to say uh, what makes it bounded is that we are thinking of all values that are quantified as uh, bounded by the terms in the free variables. And uh, here, when I'm talking about the power of a theory of arithmetic, especially in the correspondence with uh, complexity classes, it's basically what kind of functions can be probably defined in the system by, um, yeah, can be defined in this system. So the, the system proves there exists a unique value of the function. And just one caveat uh, that um, it can very well happen that there are theories that capture the same class of functions that is, they prove totality of the same class of functions. And yet one system seems to be more powerful than another system. As in, it's not believed to be that everything, every theorem that one system proves can be proved in the other. So relating this back to propositional proof systems, uh, there is a, actually a very direct connection because uh, for those kinds of theories, for one direction you could do, you could do direct translation in uh, propositional proof systems by taking theorems of the, uh, of the theory, converting them into a family of tautologies and showing that the corresponding proof system can prove that family of tautology. And for the other direction, uh, you could, show that um, the bounded arithmetic theory can prove essentially soundness, more precisely reflection principle for the corresponding proof system. So even though um, bounded arithmetic is a kind of a uniform setting and proof systems are non-uniform, there is this very tight connection between the two. And uh, uh, just to mention a few, the theory that captures AC0 would give a translation directly into AC0 Frege, bounded depth Frege. Uh, similarly, a theory for um, NC1 will give you Frege. And the uh, theories for polynomial time, they translate in this way to extended Frege. Okay. So uh, let's now uh, connect the descriptive complexity, the um, bounded arithmetic side by showing how you could build a theory of arithmetic. And if you have never seen a theory of arithmetic or built one, hopefully this would be a kind of a gentle introduction to one way of doing it. So uh, what we need in the theory, we need a language, and we need axioms. And here we are going to take a slightly different path from uh, what Sambas did in his thesis and use a two-sorted theory, which will have a much better correspondence to the descriptive complexity characterization. What I mean by two-sorted is that you have two kinds of objects. You have numbers and you have strings. Just like uh, in descriptive complexity characterization, you have your graphs, predicates as being the second order objects, so to say, floating around. Here you will have strings corresponding to the structures. And the uh, axioms of this theory would be fairly standard. Uh, first of all, for numbers, we'll just take uh, the very classic axioms defining how plus and time separate. And here we just need plus and times. For example, axiom saying that for any x, x plus one is not equal to zero. 
and um, and stuff like that. One is greater than zero and so on. Then for strings, we will have very few things. Again, we want to look at them as predicates. So uh, we will just say, um, we will just use an operator telling us what the bit of a string is. And uh, we also define what the length of the string is because we want to kind of bound things. So we want to say, um, Can, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, Antonina. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to just say that whether they can hear? I can Moshe? hear you. Okay, thank okay, you. Nice. I can so hear. I guess Th Thomas is having some problems there. And maybe it's, yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Um, in addition to those basic axioms saying what you could do with strings and what you could do with numbers, well, add and multiply numbers and take a length of the string and look up a bit, there is one more axiom. And this, is, this will be the main um, axiom that will let us define all sorts of different theories. And basically what this axiom is saying is that if you have a formula from some limited class of formulas, then you could get a characteristic string of that formula. That's really the only thing that we need to build the theory. And um, now uh, we could reason with those axioms. And in order to do reasoning, in order to do proof, uh, you could take your favorite way of doing proof. I think uh, Gensen's uh, calculus LK is the most uh, standard underlying way of doing proof, but there is really... Um... So uh, can I ask you a quick question? Please. X of Y, what, is, what does that notation mean? Is X a string here and Y is yes. a number? Uh, yeah, it just uh, uh, the Y's bit of X when X is treated as string. Okay, so you're saying if I take the yth bit of x, then it implies y must be strictly uh, the same. You kind of interpret one as a true and uh, zero as a false. So uh, another way of thinking about it is x is a set and x of y is where the y is in the set x. I see, I see. OK. And uh, comprehension, you're saying there exists a string x. X is a string variable. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to, it's less than or equal to n. So I guess the bit strings here are being interpreted as numbers implicitly. Um, well, the strings are strings. Uh, numbers okay. uh, are mainly used to um, talk about lengths and indices. Yeah, but, but what do you mean there exists an x less than or equal to n? What does that oh, mean? Oh, sorry. I didn't define this notation. Uh, so thank you so much. So what I mean is length of x less than or equal to n. OK, so there exists an x such that length of x is less than or equal to n for all uh, integer variables or uh, natural numbers z less than n. Uh, so now, if z is in the set x, uh, I see, I see, I see, I see, okay. All right. Got it. But here, but here phi is a formula in this language or is it a formula of over arithmetic? Uh, it, it's a formula in, in whatever restricted class of formulas. Uh, be defined and uh, the power of the theory will correspond to the power of that class of formulas. Okay. Yes, thank you. More questions, comments? No, nope, please go ahead. So um, one thing that you might be wondering is uh, there is induction because in piano arithmetic and pretty much pretty much all the other theories that I've seen, or vast majority of them, 
you have an induction axiom. In fact, you can actually, for all the theories that we care about, prove induction, but uh, just, um, just to have it to make life easier, here it is. Uh, given a string, you could do uh, induction on the length of the string. So if something, um, if x of zero, well, if element zero is in the set x, if you want to think about it as set, and uh, for every y, if y is in the set x, then y plus one is, then n is in the set x. Here's your induction on the length of the string. So this is really all you need to build the theory and you don't even need induction. And uh, now with those theories, um, you could prove theorems, you could uh, uh, define functions and prove totalities of the functions, you can convert them to proof systems and so on. So um, what kind of theories do we get when we do it for different, uh, so what defines the power of the theory is really what class of formulas we are allowed, the theory is allowed to talk about. So um, first of all, if we take um, as a class of formulas, um, existential second order, and here I'm, I'm treating the second order objects in the descriptive complexity setting just as strings in bounded arithmetic setting, but this really doesn't match with the translation. The translation is pretty direct. So if you take existential second order, you get the logic for NP predicates. And uh, if you make a theory out of existential second order, you make a theory that can talk about um, well, things definable by NP predicates. And uh, in particular, you get, uh, you directly get two sorted analogs of uh, Sam Bus's hierarchy S, S2. But here's the interesting thing. Um, Sam Bus proved a beautiful theor uh, theorem about the theory that operates with S so exist predicates. And the theorem says that if within the theory, uh, you could prove that, well, the function is definable, the predicate is in and P intersect co and P. So there is a so exist and a so for all formulas. And um, uh, they equivalently define the predicate. Then, in fact, you get that the predicate, the function, is in polynomial time. It is really, really beautiful result and kind of surprising. It basically says that if you reason with NP predicates, and if you can prove that something is an NP intersect co NP, then in fact it must be in polynomial time. So, sort of in the bounded arithmetic world, at least here. The provable NP intersect point P is polynomial time. A really cool, really surprising result. And uh, this naturally generalizes to levels of polynomial time hierarchy. You could talk about exist for all exist uh, second order, and it will give you a third level. And again, you could use a weakness in theorem, uh, bus weakness in theorem to capture the corresponding um, deterministic class. But you may ask the, okay, with NP predicates, we didn't quite capture NP. What we really captured is polynomial time in the case when the theory could prove that something is in NP intersect point P. But can we actually take a logic corresponding to a complexity class and get a theory for exactly the same complexity class? What would it take? Oh, yeah. uh, so before I go that, just to quickly mention for people who are familiar with uh, some buses theories, um, the, different, uh, the difference here is that in our language, we only have plus and times, but we do have um, strings. So some uh, already had theories 
the second order object. Uh, he defines series for P space, for exponential time, and so on. And there he used uh, that extra function in the language in order to define bigger things. But uh, Radborov and Takeuchi have shown that you can uh, go back and forth between the series with one more extra sort and um, having this smash operator in the language. So in our setting, we don't have any extra operators uh, and we just have the string sort and we get that this is equivalent to SI2. Okay, so uh, just to reiterate, how do we get a theory? We take axioms defining basic arithmetic and add an axiom that says all objects definable in a certain logic exist. So um, what can we do with it? We could actually extend, uh, so um, if I rem well, the series uh, SI2 and TI2 that some bus defined, um, there you do allow multiplication on big numbers, small numbers, so you generally have multiplication. But in the setting here, in the two sorted setting, you since you don't have multiplication of the larger second order object, you could actually get a theory for AC0, but you cannot do multiplication of your objects. And starting from the theory for AC0, uh, you could get um, theories for all sorts of classes within polynomial time. And how do you get a theory for AC0? Well, remember that Barrington, Nimmerman, and Strobin told us uh, that first order logic if you have arithmetic in your language, and well, you have arithmetic in your language, and arithmetic captures the log time uniform AC0. So just define uh, our class of formulas to be uh, formulas with no second order quantifiers. And uh, using beautiful characterization by Eric Gradle, we get a theory for non deterministic log space and the theory for polynomial time from second order uh, existential 2CNF formulas and second order existential Horn formulas respectively. But this correspondence is not exactly automatic because remember, if we had NP formulas, we didn't really quite get NP. We got polynomial time and this is really non-trivial result. When do we actually capture precisely the theory? And uh, this depends on how hard it is to prove closure properties of the complexity class. So what do, what do I mean by closure properties? We would like to work with really nice complexity classes. And nice complexity class of which NP is not quite are closed under first order operations. You could take ends and ors and nots and bounded quantification. You can compose things and you still remain within the class. So um, in particular for NP, it's a very good question whether it's closed under uh, negation, let alone whether it's probable closed under negation. So NP and classes in the polynomial time hierarchy are not really quite robust to get those kinds of results. But polynomial time, non-deterministic log space, non-triviality, and AC0 definitely are. And another caveat is that we really want those properties to be provable within the reasoning in the system. So, and here it is. It's a generic statement that if you can actually prove using reasoning this only concept from that class, that the class is closed under first order operations, then um, you get a system of arithmetic that precisely captures this complexity class, as in it proves um, totality exactly of the functions from this class. 
So this gives you an automatic way to take a logic characterization of a complexity class, whichever one your favorite complexity class is, and convert it into a theory of arithmetic. So uh, I'm really out of time, but let me just say for AC0, it's direct. AC0 is closed under AC0. For polynomial time and for NL, it's a bit more work because you actually need to formalize form satisfiability and the proof that NL equal co NL within NL reasoning, within polytime reasoning, but this can be done. At even trickier class um, log CFL, SAC1, uh, was done by Satoru Kuroda. And um, And basically the way you do it is you build the theory and then you generalize uh, bus witnessing theorem to the new setting. So just to say that the, not the only way of building theories, for example, um, Cook and Gwen in their book, uh, they also use an approach of taking a complete problem for a class and uh, throwing it in as an axiom, defining axiom for that problem, and then building theories on that. But um, generally, at least you can definitely translate from, um, from descriptive complexity. Okay, um, so I'm out of time. So let me just say that this, this talk was mostly kind of a segue from this week's topic, a finite model theory in descriptive complexity to next week's topics, which will um, touch upon many different aspects of reasoning systems, in particular, I think systems of arithmetic, from piano arithmetic to bounded arithmetic. But uh, hopefully um, here um, you could see how you could go from the power, from the expressive power to a reasoning power in essentially in one method. Okay, thank you so much. And any questions, comments? Awesome, thank you for a beautiful and enlightening talk, Antonina, thank you very much. Questions, please. So, so I have some comments and uh, questions. So. Uh, in a different setting, I actually study theories over arithmetic and strings. And I'm surprised that there is this, uh, I wasn't aware of this, uh, these theories over strings and arithmetic that were defined by Cook and others. Um, and I would be happy to chat with you offline about potential connections because there are many open questions there, um, which have been open for maybe 70 years or something like that. And I wonder whether um, any of these connections can be helpful in resolving some of those questions. Some of them are complexity theoretic, others are more, uh, you know, decidability you know, and so on. Uh, but in any event, uh, it would be interesting to, uh, you know, explore those connections. Um, any additional questions? Yeah, I have one question it's Please, about this SL equals L result. Mm -hmm. So the existence of expander graphs, you do it with the zigzag product. And that's uh, what yeah. mm -hmm. There's a kind of a zigzag, yeah. So which part is missing to get the formalization? Is it the uh, uh, Yeah, what's missing is that the, you could prove the existence of expander graphs when you start with things, small things with constant expansion and you combine them and you keep expansion constant. What to do when you start with something that does not have a constant expansion? That's what we haven't figured out. Okay, thanks. Hi, Antonina. Uh, uh, can you comment on these two approaches? Uh, you mentioned like Cook Mue and uh, your approach using finite model theory. Uh, so what are the differences between, let's say the theories you get for NL by, by doing such things? Like, is, is there an easy way to, or, or are they exactly the same, they prove the same theorem? So what exactly happens? They do prove the same theorems. Um, I, I think Steve has, uh, Stephen Fong have in their book, 
the connections all the different ways, but they, I think, as far as I know, they do prove the same theorems. Um, I see, thanks. So even the theory operating with uh, own formula does prove the same theory as uh, PV, but interestingly, it's much easier to formalize the recursive definition using the Horn formula than go the other way around. Yeah. Any additional questions? So I, I'll yeah, try to put Sam, together a ahead. question for, so for Antonita. So I was struck by the same thing that Ian Kaur mentioned that you, you split your, you were categorizing things that introduced all functions all at once versus things that sort of built up to get all functions. I've always ca categorized more the first order theories versus the second order theories. So we sort of have two, two different viewpoints of this. Does this mean there's really three different ways to set up bound, bound arithmetic? Do you view it this way? Um, I'm taking particular of your paper with Steve on CROM and so forth and uh, with um, proving, so, uh, proving that, N, that NL equals co-NL. That's a, that's a different type of bootstrapping you think than the things that the theories use induction? Um, that's a different type of bootstrapping, um, yes, but you, you would know much better than I do what does a different thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, I've certainly read all this. I just never, it's just you obviously have a bit different view, view, viewpoint of this. So I was interested to get your, your feeling about this. Um, yeah. So you, you can definitely start with um, an axiom that uh, uh, gives you a totality of, for example, graph reachability or circuit evaluation problem and build theory on top of that. And you end up with nice theory, universally axiomatized and everything. And I think you could prove the equivalence um, between this theory and the theory based on um, the descriptive complexity view. And, um, and the theories like PV that come from recursive definitions. Right. I, as far as I know, they're equivalent, but as th that's a very good way of saying that you did you need a different type of bootstrapping in each case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I guess the other comment is you seems seemingly we need to go to the second order versions of the theories to deal with these very weak classes like L and L and NL and so forth and SAC one, I suppose, and so forth. Um, I guess just because we get uh, AC1, since we don't have multiplication of the larger objects. Right. So, yeah. And, and going from descriptive complexity to second order is a bit more uh, kind of, it's a bit easier than, at least for me, <laughs> to think about because in descriptive complexity, you do have those uh, second order objects floating around. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Antonina, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. So thanks to all the speakers for great talks. Thank you. Yes, thank you to everybody. And I guess we will be on uh, Gata Town, at least some of us after this. Soon. Yeah. All right. So see you tomorrow then. Bye bye, everybody. Tomorrow or see you on Gata Town. And I will call Gata Town. You in a second. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic talk. Thanks.